uh, I gotta, I gotta tell you the, uh, you know, over the course of the last few months, I've been trying to help out in the sound booth up there, uh, from time to time. And I gotta tell you, I'm infinitely more comfortable back there than I am up here. Okay. So please bear with me this morning as I go through all this stuff. And, uh, I also would like to say that, uh, you know, I hope, I hope you guys just appreciate what Drew brings to the table every Sunday because, uh, um, I mean, the information that gives you is just really, uh, really kind of uh, moving, life moving. And uh, but also wanted to share that, uh, you know, this guy, he also has a wonderful gift of improv because he'll lay out, you know, he lays out his uh, his sermons up here on the on this tray and he gives them up there to us. But he also has he has a innate ability to just go completely off script. You know, I I don't have. And I'll sit there, I'm trying to watch, I'm trying to, uh, you know, follow his sermon on his script, and he goes off, and I'm trying to, you know, frantically find out where he is and come back to it a little bit later, so. But uh, anyway, I don't have that ability. Um, my my script, my uh, message this morning, pretty well go, pretty well verbatim, so maybe uh, easy for Joel to watch, but my biggest fear when talking to you guys is uh, sounding like a, a old pathology uh, instructor I had when I was going through PT school been, for 50 minutes straight, three days a week for for a semester. I mean, this guy had a had a voice that kind of sounded like, um, you know, whenever you're cleaning off your your plate and just putting stuff in the garbage disposal, and that piece of gristle that gets stuck in there. Rah, 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 50 minutes, but you had to go because you knew he was if you, you knew if you didn't go that one day he was going to throw that pop quiz at you that that would cost that cost you about 20 percent of your grade so you had to kind of suffer through that so but anyway we're ready to go up there joel okay thank you so all right here we go so uh let's uh start off this morning by talking about something which i think pretty well kind of perk up everybody's intention and that's uh gifts so I want you to take a moment to think of any occasion, whether it be, uh, you know, like a birthday or Christmas, uh, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, or just any random Thursday where you, when you really got a gift that you, you're really hoping to get. So while you're thinking of this particular gift, I'll share one that sticks out with you in my memory. So when I was about eight years old, the Mattel Toy Company had this little handheld electronic video game or uh, football game. Uh, some of the kids in my class would, would bring it and uh, would play with this particular game whenever we had breaks in class. You know, occasionally one of the kids would would uh, invite me to play with them, and when offered, I jumped at the chance. So this game was kind of like a premier video game of its time. So this is about the same time that the uh, you know the Atari home system started coming out. So you know, if you were here last week and you heard Drew said he felt dated playing Sega Genesis, how old does that make me feel? And I'm sitting there talking about Ataris. So I remember pleading with my mom to see if we could get one. Now, my mom was pretty convinced that uh, the advent of the home video game was going to lead to the downfall of Western civilization as we knew it, so she declined to get one. Um, the more I pled with her about getting the video games, I learned that, uh, you know, she was, she was uh, pretty well immovable when it came to that kind of stuff. Uh, the more I would uh, beg her or plead her with, to you know, for the video game or anything else that, that I wanted that she seemed unfit, the deeper she dug her heels in. You know, eventually I was going to, I learned that I was going to lose this battle or any other battle that I fought with her and would just stop asking altogether. You know, she's a firm discipline of the school of thought with the uh, appreciate what you have mantra. So I, I pretty well um, grew up learning to accept this as a way of life. Mom, however, is a tremendous giver. She's a giver of her time, her efforts, her resources, and probably most importantly, her love and compassion. And on Christmas Day of 1982, she was the giver of the Mattel football game that I so badly wanted. So did you think of your gift yet? Whatever you got, I bet you experienced the same kind of excitement and joy that I received when I, when I opened my football game that day. I remember having a lot of fun with that game for about a year, but the problem with that gift is that, you know, eventually the newness and the elation you get when you open it for the first time eventually fades away. You know, other things become inter more interesting and you lose interest in it. But uh, it may wind up on some shelf or up in your closet kind of collecting dust or something. Uh, as for my particular game, uh, I don't know what happened to it, but I, as a late 40s something, I kind of wish I'd, I'd had it all over again. It'd be like brand new all over. 
So I'm, and I'm not sure at what phase of life this happens. Uh, probably differs with different people. But uh, whenever it was, I eventually got to the point where getting stuff wasn't nearly as gratifying or as exciting as it was to giving gifts to people. Now I want you to switch your gears, switch gears in your thinking a little bit. Now think of a time in which you gave a gift to someone in which they responded in the same way that I did when I got my football game. Again, while you're thinking of your gift, I'll share mine with you. My dad turned 75 about three weeks ago. Now, over the course of this last winter, he built him a new machine shed uh, on his farm to house some of his uh, diesel tractors, which he really badly needed because um, it used to be he'd keep them in just an open sheds, but the, the cold weather during the winter would freeze up the fuel lines and he wouldn't be able to start them uh, to be able to feed his cows. My brother came up with the idea of putting um, signs in the shed that kind of acted a little bit like our family's history. Uh, for example, my dad will refuse to drive anything else but a John Deere tractor. So my, my brother found a sign that says, uh, only John Deere found here. Um, all three of us grew up watching the Cardinals, and it's kind of in our bloodline to be fans of them. So there'll probably be a couple metal signs hanging up in the shed that say that as well, too. So um, I'm looking at look at the ages of all you out here, and I was like, I don't know if many of you have ever seen MASH. How many of you have seen MASH? Just a, okay, more than I thought. Good. <laughs> For anyway, for, for those of you who watched MASH back in the day, um, do you recall what the inside of the officers club looked like? Have you ever, ever noticed what the back wall looked like? Okay, there are several different kinds of you know, military insignias hanging up on that back wall. And there, there was one that stood out uh, for, a, for an air ambulance unit. And when I saw that sign, it, it had one of those, that's it kind of moments. My dad was a helicopter pilot for a National Guard medevac unit out of Jefferson City for about 15 years. And when I saw that sign on the officer's club, I thought, what better way to contribute to our new uh, uh, sign collection by making a sign of that insignia for our unit. At first, I sought to make the logo out of uh, metal so we could kind of hang it on the outside of the building so not only we would see it, but everybody else that drove by the farm would see it as well. But there were too many intricate cuts in, the, in this to, to make that possible, so I had to go to plan B. Um, what I wound up doing is just getting a piece of plywood and uh, getting an overhead projector and projecting it on the on the wood, and I cut it to size and uh, you know painted it all up the best I could. And here's what the end result looks like. So I gave it to him a couple weeks ago. On the exterior, my dad gives off the vibe that he's you know, he's a pretty stern guy, which you know he can be when he needs to be. But deep inside, and you'll never get him to admit this, is that he's a pretty emotional guy. You know, you get him to talk about memories of the past and um, speaking of uh, family members and friends that have since passed away, you know, it'll tend to stoke his emotions a little bit. This particular unit went to Desert Storm in back in 1991. Uh, this is his family away from his family for several months. In a way, this sign kind of serves as a mental scrapbook for him. He didn't shed any tears when he, when he got the sign, but you could tell he, it was just starting to turn his emotions about a little bit. So it sounds kind of kind of mean on my part, but I think it's kind of cool when you can stir emotions up in people like that in a, in a good in a good way, of course. So what's in a gift? Why do we even give gifts in the first place? Well, let me give you this example to kind of help explain. You know, for my for my birthday every year, my mother gives me gets me a, a red velvet cake, and you're probably sitting there sitting here thinking, okay, everybody gets cake. What's what's the big deal? I said, well, the big deal is this is the absolute best cake in the world. That's why. This cake is always so rich and moist, but the real deal is in the icing. You know, the icing my mom puts on there is like an old family recipe. It's been handed down for, center, for several generations, I think, ever since from, my, from her great-grandmother. Uh, you know, this white icing has you know, just the right amount of sweetness to it where you don't, you don't get sick where, if you eat too much of it. And it's also made with real butter, too, so it's always real thick and rich. This is just my own personal opinion, but it's probably about as close to perfection as you're going to eat and you're going to consume on Earth. So, This cake is also pretty good size as well, too, so I, I find myself in a dilemma. I could choose to sit there and hog the, hog the cake all for myself and spend the next three weeks for, for two hours straight on the, on the stationary bike trying to burn this thing off, or I could choose to share it with everybody else in the house. Well, that's why I'm going to share it, because one, you don't let something this divine go to waste. And two, 
the pleasure you get from this cake now gets to be shared with everybody else. You know, we, we give because it makes us happy. Not only does it make us happy, but it makes the others with whom, you know, we share with happy as well. You know, giving is inherently embedded in our DNA. You know, we thrive as a society because we're constantly sharing and giving to one another. You know, we share and give at this church um, every time we get together for our Sunday meals at the end of the month. We share our, idea, our ideas with, uh, at our workplace to not only help improve ourselves, but hopefully the others around us to help, to help one another achieve, excuse me, achieve a common goal. You know, we share with our kids our values and our beliefs, so hopefully when they become of age, they'll, become, they'll be able to make good informed decisions uh, for themselves that will help impact the world around them in a positive manner. You know, the fact that we're, that we're happier and when we give isn't some kind of philosophical rhetoric from ancient Greece or something. Uh, I mean, there's numerous studies out there to show that, that you know, when you give to others, the smile you put on your face is, is uh, much bigger than the, one, than the temporary one you give yourself when you spend something on yourself. You know, a thoughtful and well-timed gift can strengthen and develop your connections with other people. But you don't want to just give just to be giving. Uh, you want to give some, give because you want to make someone feel special. You want to make them feel appreciated and wanted. And maybe even perhaps like a king or a queen, if only just for a little while. This brings me to a couple guys that also sought to treat someone else like a king. The first man's name is uh, Joseph. And no, this is not the Joseph of the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat fame. It's also not Joseph, uh, the father of Jesus. The one who I'm re referring to is Joseph of Arimathea. The second man's name is Nicodemus, and he is the, the Nicodemus of the You Must Be Born Again conversation. Uh, these two gentlemen have much in common. First, both of them are Pharisees that served on the Sanhedrin, which is, you know, the, Jewish, which is the Jewish version of the Supreme Court. Well, based on the fact that these guys both served in this capacity, uh, shows that they were both well-respected and educated men among, amongst the Jewish community. Second of all, they were both men of great wealth. And finally, and this is our dirty little secret, if you will, they were both secret followers of Jesus. The problem for both Joseph and Nicodemus is that even though they were both prominent members in their community, they also had to live with a great deal of fear. Uh, they, lived, they lived in the fear of what others might think if others spotted them talking to, talking to Jesus, and they also lived in fear of what they, they stood to lose if they were, were found doing so. When Jesus began his ministry, Nicodemus uh, became increasingly confused and intrigued by Jesus' teachings and wanted to learn more. Uh, this posed a problem for him because as a member of the Sanhedrin, if you're seen, seen mingling with Jesus out in broad daylight, this could also this could look like an act of treason amongst his fellow council members. Nicodemus chose to meet with Jesus anyway, but did so under the cover of darkness and, and so that no one else would see. He had seen the miracles that Jesus had been performing and was convinced that he was from God. Nicodemus was in search of the kingdom of God. Joseph was looking for the exact same thing. Somewhere along the line, Joseph and Nicodemus would have to make a very important decision. When the Sanhedrin convened and decided to put Jesus on trial, both, the men, both of these men balked at the idea. And this is what we read about their actions at the council proceedings. First of all, we'll look in uh, Luke chapter 7. Uh, we read this. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? And later on in, in chapter 23, we, read, we see um, this. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man that had not consented to their decision and action. These were both good men. They, they, uh, they were uh, both moral gentlemen who were trying to live for God and uphold his commandments. Uh, this put them in a, really a significant uh, moral dilemma. I mean, these were like two guys that were wearing the wrong colored jerseys at the ball game. I mean, this is like seeing Mahomes and Kelsey walking around in Raiders jerseys. I mean, it's just something fundamentally just wrong about that, right? That's too horrible a thought to think. Let's move on. Uh, they both knew what was happening to Jesus was wrong, but what could they do about it? I mean, uh, Jesus' pending death was pretty well, you know, cut and dried deal at this point. Could they have done more to stop the, the crucifixion? Uh, I'm not sure, but I do have a thought on that. Um, I'd like to believe that deep down, both these guys knew that Jesus' death on the cross was fulfilling God's will, so they really didn't have much choice but to just kind of stand by and watch it all happen. 
Sometime uh, in between the trial before the Sanhedrin and the crucifixion, Joseph and Nicodemus had made the decision that they were going to make their private faith in Jesus public. Once Jesus had died, Joseph had uh, made a request to Pilate that must have just completely blew his mind. And Jesus approached Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus to bury. Can you imagine the look on, on Pilate's face at that request? Here's Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, a, uh, a member of the body that just signed Jesus' death certificate, now asking for the body to give it a proper, proper funeral. Well, perplexed as he might have been at this request, Pilate grants uh, permission for Joseph to do just that. And Joseph is met at the cross uh, by Nicodemus. There, they both take the body down off the cross and carry it away. Uh, now, keep in mind at this time that uh, for someone of the Jewish faith to even touch a corpse was in violation of Mosaic law. Jesus, Jesus was crucified as a criminal, and back in, during this time, bodies of executed criminals were either were just carried away to an open field and, and covered up with a you know, pile of rocks or just put in a shallow grave. Instead, these two gentlemen take Jesus to a tomb that Joseph had already constructed for himself. This of itself is quite a generous uh, gesture for Joseph because a, a custom hand-carved uh, tomb made out of rock surely didn't come cheap, and neither did the stone in which to conceal the tomb. To help prep uh, Jesus' body, Nicodemus arranges for 75 pounds of myrrh to be brought to anoint the body for, for final uh, burial. Just out of curiosity, I looked. I looked up to see what the what the price of myrrh was. Uh, apparently, nowadays you can get myrrh like any corner drugstore for like fifteen dollars a pound. But back during this time, I guess it was quite the rare commodity. Um, uh, you know, a pound of myrrh back in Jesus' time went for as much as four thousand of our dollars per pound. So do the math: seventy-five pounds at four thousand dollars a pound. That adds up to three hundred thousand dollars. That, that sounds like an exorbitant amount to, to use for one body. The, the expense that, they put, uh, that, they, that these two guys put forth for Jesus' burial, though, was fit for royalty. However, this uh, funeral arrangement that these two guys made uh, for Jesus fulfilled a prophecy made by Isaiah 750 years earlier. And here's what we read in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 53. And his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor there was any deceit in his mouth. The point of all this is that what, G what uh, Joseph and Nicodemus did for Christ in his death was what the nation of Israel wouldn't give Jesus during his life, and that's acknowledgement as king. Now, all this is quite a gift, and I don't want to give you the impression that you have to go through an extreme uh, personal expense to find the kingdom of God. I mean, 300 Gs is an awful lot of scratch to put down on someone, and not many of us could afford that anyway. So I want to take a few moments to talk about someone that perhaps we can you know, relate a little bit more closely to. All right. uh, so when I was younger, if, you know, if I did something that, that in which I probably didn't use the best judgment, and if my mother had witnessed whatever I'd done, she would occasionally call me a Dorcas. To, <laughs> to a young teenager, uh, you know, this might be a little bit of a blow to your self-esteem, but uh, Little did I know at the time that she was actually paying me a compliment in an offhanded way, and here's why. In Acts chapter 9, we find a woman by the name of Tabitha, which was her name in Aramaic. Tabitha's name translated in Greek is Dorcas. Dorcas lived in the Mediterranean port city of Joppa. Dorcas was a, se was a seamstress by trade, but probably her most important role in Joppa was using her time and talents in, in sewing to make clothing for the widows in the community. She was apparently quite good at it and did it with abundant energy. Here's what Luke says about Dorcas in uh, verse 36. Now this woman was abundant with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. For some reason, though, Dorcas suddenly becomes ill and passes away. Some of the local folks hear that, that Peter is preaching in a nearby town, and they send two gentlemen over to this uh, town to see if they can uh, persuade the uh, you know, Peter to come back to Joppa to see what he could do. Uh, Peter accepts the invitation, and, and when he arrives, he's surrounded by a large group of widows weeping at the loss of their friend, their friend Dorcas and showing him all, all the clothing that she had made for them while she was alive. Peter then goes up to the room in which they had laid Dorcas, 
summons everyone to leave the room, kneels down before her, and simply says, Tabitha, get up. She opens her eyes, gets up, and the two of them walk outside to greet the grieving widows together. Now, Peter, um, raising Dorcas from the dead, I mean, undoubtedly is, is a miracle. Uh, and why, why she was chosen to be raised from the dead and say someone perhaps like Stephen, who had been stoned to death just a couple uh, chapters earlier, I, I'll leave that conversation for another day. But for the sake of this discussion, I just want to take a few moments to kind of talk about the kind of person that, that Dorcas was. You know, first of all, she had to be a very compassionate woman. I don't know for sure, and I never did, and never does say, but I would understand the reason that Dorcas probably devoted so much of her time and her resources to the widows of Joppa is, is, is maybe mainly, uh, perhaps maybe she was one herself. You know, she could sympathize with their needs, and she knew the difficulties in which they were going through and just simply wanted to ease some of the pain that perhaps she was going through herself. Uh, second of all, uh, she utilized her gifts, not, not sparingly, but consistently. Uh, if you kind of view giving in this manner, it's, it's kind of like investing. You know, you, when you first start investing, you go to the, you go, go to the bank and you put in a few coins, and you think, well, we'll see what happens from here. But uh, you know, over the course of time, you do that you know consistently over the course of time, and that, that that compound interest can really you know add up and make a significant difference over that period of time. And finally, Dorcas left a legacy, a legacy of gifts to people that she barely even knew. Through her continuous work, she continued to touch life after life, so much so that when she died, it wasn't just one or two widows that had gathered to, to mourn her passing, but it was an entire crowd. We don't know what happened to Dorcas after Peter raised her from the dead, but uh, I would be willing to bet that for, for her, it was probably back to, to life as usual, trying to endlessly working to make a difference in as many lives as she could. So making a difference in the lives of people around you, now that's a gift that we can all contribute. And my apologies to Jamie, but I thought I was going to be able to make it through a communion or a message without a sports reference, but this one's too good to pass up personally, so I apologize to you. <laughs> you, you had mentioned in the uh, communion uh, earlier about everybody's uh, gifts and what they, so that's that reference there. <laughs> anyway, all right, so at about this time last year, uh, my wife and I were watching a district girls basketball game out here at the high school that was played between uh, Southern Boone and California. Uh, the game was pretty tight most of the way, and I don't remember at any point of the, the game where you know, either team had a lead of much more than five points. Uh, late in the game, however, one of the girls from California uh, went down with a leg injury. Uh, you can see the pain and the frustration on her face to not only get hurt, but to happen at such a critical time of the ball game. Her team wound up losing the ball game by a couple points and thus ending their season. As fate would have it, though, this would not be the last time I would see this young lady as she wound up tearing her ACL in a, a competitive uh, travel ball uh, game sometime last spring. Uh, she wound up having surgery on it back in June, and, uh, and after she had her surgery, she started coming to see me in my clinic down in California at about at the end of the month. Uh, you know, when she first came to see me, you know, obviously she's a little bit down. Uh, this has happened just right before her senior year. Uh, you know, she was wondering uh, if she's going to be able to ever even play her uh, school ball session uh, schedule at all. Uh, she started a rehab at the end of June, and, and knowing full well that from the time you have ACL surgery to the time you return to sport, it's 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 uh, you know bare minimum of six months. So, so I told her, to, and school ball usually starts you know, right around Thanksgiving. So I told her she. It's probably not going to be able to start the season, but if she put in the, the work and the effort, uh, I saw that she had an excellent chance of being able to make it back you know, by the start of this calendar year. Man, and work she did. She put in the work. Uh, she, she did everything just to the absolute best of her abilities. And by the time she w went back for a follow-up appointment with her surgeon around Christmas time, she could finally got the green light to return to, turn to play. And... I just remember the just the sheer excitement and the smile that she had on her face when she came in for her final treatment, and I, I so wish that I should I could show you guys a picture of it, but uh, because this this smile is you know is bright enough to you know light up a, a big city, but I I can't because of HIPAA laws, so I apologize about that. Um, she had begged me to you know, come out and watch her play, but I didn't want to do so right away for fear of making her nervous. 
Uh, so I, I let her just kind of settle into a role in the team for a while before I went out. And, you know, back in uh, February, I finally made it to a couple of her home games. At the be beginning of this month, uh, their district tournament started. Uh, they wanted to win in their first game and advance to the championship game. Now, this game was uh, played down in Osage Beach. And, uh, you know, I've, it was played on a Thursday night, and I was pretty tired, and I debated about, about going at all, but I finally kind of talked myself into it. I wouldn't regret my, my decision. I got to go see a really good game, uh, by the way. It was, it was close all the way, and it actually went into overtime. California actually wound up winning the game, and when the buzzer sounded, the girls all naturally, you know, hugged and piled on top of one another to celebrate. Normally, after you know, after a game like this, I would just you know head out to my truck and just proceed to leave just to try to beat the traffic a little bit. But you know, something something in my head told me you may want to stick around just a little while longer for for this. At least I, I mean, at the bare minimum, I at least wanted to congratulate her on her big win. Um, you know, the girls uh, had a short talk in the in the locker room, and then came back out to you know take pictures with their district trophy and with their parents and with their with their teammates and such. So. And this went on for about you know, 20 minutes or so, and then the crowd started to kind of thin out a little bit. Um, so after, after it kind of thinned out, uh, I, I tried to start making my way over to congratulate her. And then what happens next was, was something I will never forget for, for as long as I live. Um, I, uh, I've never really watched The Matrix, but I know there's like a, a concept in there where you can kind of, everything kind of slows down and you can kind of push things off to the side. Is that is that true? <laughs> uh, okay, I want to make sure that's that's that was a good reference anyway that you guys can relate to. But anyway, when she sees me, it's like everybody else all of a sudden everybody in slow motion gets in the gym gets pushed off to the court. And and when I uh, when she saw me, what I, I thought was going to happen is she'd walk over and just we shake hands and you know she'd say you know thanks for coming i appreciate it but uh quite the contrary when she saw me she doesn't walk she takes down a dead sprint and hits me with such force she about knocks me over and uh you know she gives, she gives me the, this probably the best bear one of the best bear hugs i've ever gotten in my life uh she was uh you know so happy for um you know what had just happened i mean i don't think she let go for about 30 seconds it was it was that long and uh you know i proceeded to tell her how how happy i was for for everything she'd been through for the last year and then uh then she proceeds to tell me probably the best thing that that any uh patient has ever given or told me in my nearly 26 years as a as a practitioner and uh she leans in and simply says i couldn't have done it without you that moment that hug that smile and those words I thought, man, what a what a perfect metaphor for you know whenever our time done on, on earth is done, because um, we're not I'm not going to be able to give God anything that He doesn't already have. I mean, He's got full dominion over everything here down on earth already. But I thought if there was one thing that we could give Him, I think whenever uh, we see Him, as if we see Him come running toward Him, give Him a big embrace and just tell Him. Um, that uh, I couldn't have done it without you. You get a heartfelt embrace from someone who truly cares about you, and that's, that really is a true gift. So I want to apologize if I've been a little bit long-winded, so I'll try to make my closing short. Maybe you think that sometimes when you give a gift, it's of little significance. But if it comes from your heart, there's no limit to its significance. God didn't send Jesus down to us just because he deemed it necessary. He did it from his heart because of his love for us. Jesus was the perfect gift for us. You know, to paraphrase James chapter 1, verse 27, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above. These gifts come down from the Father. Our gift back to him is to reciprocate the favor. Now, you may think that your actions are small and don't seem to make much of a difference, but Jesus said otherwise when he said, when you do something for the least of his brothers and sisters, you do it to him as well. His love for us now that's our gift, and that's what's in the gift that keeps on giving. The musicians are going to come forward, and we're going to sing a song. Uh, this is our time of invitation. Every week here at Ashland Christian Church, we send out an invitation to to anyone that is very much kindly.